So one thing that you hear a lot about that affects exercise performance is altitude. So how high you are uh, above sea level on Earth. So if you are at high altitudes, um, something about the air changes that makes it more difficult for us to get oxygen in our blood. And that thing that changes is the pressure of the air. So oftentimes you'll hear people say that there's less oxygen at altitude. It's not so much that there's a less uh, percentage of oxygen, it's just how much air gets into your lungs per breath that changes. So if you look at this diagram here, we have what air is like at sea level. So it's about 21% oxygen, about 78% nitrogen, which our bodies don't really use for anything, and then about 1% a mixture of other things, and within that other is CO2. Um, if you look at the exact same, so this is uh, the configuration here at sea level, if you put those together as a, a diagram, you look at that ex exact same configuration at altitude, and this is a moderate amount of altitude. This is what it would be at Mexico City, um, so 2,210 meters of elevation. And suddenly the, the air spreads out quite a bit. Uh, and this, the reason for this spread is because of pressure. So think of it like having a bunch of air sitting on top of you or a bunch of anything sitting on top of you kind of pushing you down. It pushes you into a smaller and smaller space and you feel that pressure. Well, air is the same way. So when you go up in elevation, there's less above the air molecules at that elevation. So there's less pressure pushing them to be tighter and tighter together. So if they're not as tight together, they're going to be a little more spread out. The volume of air in your lungs doesn't change. So if your lungs are five liters, your lungs are still going to be five liters at altitude, but within that five liters, there's going to be fewer molecules of air of all types of air. And so what this does is this causes what we normally are is normoxic. So in other words, we have a normal, healthy amount of oxygen um, getting into our lungs and flowing through our bloodstream. And if it's extreme enough, you can become hypoxic. Hypoxic means you don't have as, as much oxygen as what your body normally has or what it needs to optimal function. So at altitude, we can run into these issues, especially extreme altitude on top of large mountains. You can run into issues where it can be even deadly. Aerobic based exercise events, so things like um, marathons, long distance running uh, uh, in general, uh, long distance cycling, maybe long distance swimming, all those events that require us to produce our energy primarily using oxygen are going to be at a disadvantage at, uh, at a level of altitude above sea level. Events that don't use aerobic metabolism, so the shorter anaerobic type events, um, shot put, uh, sprinters, long jump, um, you know, most uh, act, most actions in like a baseball game, they're more anaerobic in nature. So the effects on exercise performance are going to be minimal, at, if at all, in those sports. And even some sports actually have a small improvement in altitude because these molecules, again, are they're less densely packed, which means there's going to be less air resistance. So a sport um, or an event like, so long jump and track, you're actually going to get a very, very small improvement in long jump performance because there's less drag from the air around you. So for our purposes, we're going to say that altitude is anything where there is a, um, a minimum of 1,500 meters of altitude. All right, so 1,500 meters, so about a mile up in the air. So we're talking basically something like Denver, Colorado here. Um, so that would be considered moderate altitude. High altitude would be about 3,000 meters to 5,500 meters. And this is the point in time where you're going to start getting some maybe mountain sickness. So the uh, negative health consequences of not having that oxygen densely packed together. And then when we get to extreme altitudes, so greater than 5,500 meters is when you start getting severe hypoxia. And this is where the highest permanent settlements on Earth are. So uh, settlements like some of the places up in the Chilean mountains. This level of altitude is going to cause pretty severe um, impact on uh, aerobic function, which is going to decrease uh, sports performance in aerobic-based events. Um, and for most people, it's going to cause impact on the sort of normal resting level function, which is why some people again get that acute mountain sickness. So when we go up to altitude acutely, and by acutely I'm meaning uh, you're right now I'm at sea level. If I were to go up to the top of a mountain, um, you know, drove my car up there right now, 
what would I feel for the next few hours to maybe a few days or so. So we'd have an increase in our basal metabolic rate. Basal metabolic rate is essentially our resting metabolic rate, so how much energy do we use just sitting here doing nothing. So we're going to have an increase in some hormones being released that affect this, so thyroxine from the thyroid gland and catecholamines from the sympathetic nervous system are going to be released in higher quantities. And this is going to increase, again, this is going to increase our basal metabolic rate, which means we're going to need to take in more food to maintain our body mass um, because we're just simply burning more calories. We're also going to have a shift where we're going to have more glucose metabolism than fat metabolism. And this is simply because of this shift in hormones uh, causing uh, us to function more anaerobically um, and less aerobically because of the uh, lower amount of oxygen getting into our bloodstream. So because we're using more glucose and less fat metabolism, we're going to have more lactic acid being produced because lactic acid is only produced when we break down glucose. So we're going to have increased levels of lactic acid initially after we uh, acclimate to the altitude, those several days to weeks um, being up at that level of altitude, our lactic acid production actually decreases. And right now, we don't know exactly why this is. I'm sure there are some theories out there, but there just isn't uh, consensus among all researchers of exactly what this is doing. And so this is called the lactate paradox, because again, we're using more glucose for metabolism, but we're producing less lactic acid. So some more effects that happen when we first get up to altitude. So in the first few hours, we're going to have a decrease in plasma volume. So plasma is Again, that liquid portion of our blood. So our total blood volume is going to drop because of this. So this is due to the drier air at altitude and because of some of the shifts that are happening within our body um, as far as the liquids in our body. So we're going to produce more urine when we first go up, and so we're going to lose a lot of volume that way. Um, and we're going to have a little bit more respiratory loss because of that dry air. Um, so the short-term effect of this is a smaller blood volume, but the blood volume that, or the blood that is there is going to be more concentrated uh, red blood cells. So we're going to have a higher hemoglobin concentration, higher hematocrit level, which is the percentage of blood that is red blood cells, um, all due to that uh, essentially dehydration of the blood, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and so this is going to help to compensate initially for the lack of um, oxygen getting onto the red blood cells because every beat of the heart is going to carry more red blood cells with it because of this sort of hemo concentration that's taking place. In the weeks to months after you've gone to altitude, uh, so this is after you've acclimated to it, you're going to actually have more red blood cells floating around. So you're going to have urethropoietin, which is the abbreviation is EPO. Um, it's going to be released by the kidneys uh, when it senses uh, a low um, uh, oxygen content, and then we're going to have increased red blood cell counts over time. So this is one of the reasons why you hear people who go to altitude in order to train or to live, and so that they can come back to sea level and have uh, more oxygen in their blood. This is why they're doing it. That's how it works. So in that first week and a half or so at um, altitude, uh, during some maximal exercise, we're going to have a slight increase in cardiac output represented by a Q sub max here and a very, very large increase in heart rate max. And this large increase in heart rate max is going to compensate for the slight decrease in stroke volume uh, that's going to occur because of that decrease in blood volume that we already talked about. So that decrease in blood volume uh, causes the decrease in stroke volume max. What causes the increase in heart rate max? So heart rate's always going to be tied to the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to um, be ramped up due to all the um, sensory neurons of the body sensing low oxygen, causing an increase in sympathetic drive to the heart, and again, that increase in heart rate that's going to increase our cardiac output. After that first week and a half or so, what we're going to have is an increase in AVO2 difference. So AVO2 difference is the arterial versus venous oxygen um, blood content. So, so we have a greater AVO2 difference, so we're taking out more of the oxygen from the blood, which allows us to function better at altitude because we're extracting more of the oxygen where we, so we can utilize that oxygen. So the effects of altitude are going to slowly be diminished because of that. Um, they might not come all the way back down the rest. depends on how high you are. Um, so how high up in elevation you are, 
um, but it is going to help here. And that is going to reduce the demand on cardiac output submaximally. So this initial increase in um, submaximal cardiac output might come down a little bit because of this improved AVO2 difference. And this is what we're seeing here. So with an increase in exercise intensity, we always have an increase in heart rate. Um, and at submaximal exercise, we're going to have this elevation in uh, heart rate, regardless of the exercise intensity um, between altitude and sea level. So with maximal exercise, the first six to 10 days, we're going to have a decrease in cardiac output max. We're going to have a decrease in stroke volume max, and we're also going to have a decrease in heart rate max. So that again, the stroke volume, the heart rate, multiply those two together, you get cardiac output max, which is um, why those, that is going to decrease because the other two are. So the stroke volume max is going to go down because of the plasma volume decrease like we've just discussed already. The heart rate max is going to go down a little bit simply because the heart stops being as responsive to sympathetic activity. So that constant sympathetic drive is going to essentially cause a down regulation where it's going to um, be less impactful on the heart. We're also going to have a decrease in AVO2 difference um, when compared to what you'd see uh, at uh, a normal elevation, so at sea level, so a lower AVO2 difference compared to sea level, a lower um, uh, cardiac output um, compared to sea level at maximal exercise intensity, and that's going to decrease our VO2 by quite a bit. So VO2 is that how much oxygen we consume to produce aerobic energy. All right, so if we have a decrease in aerobic energy being produced, we're going to have a decrease in exercise capacity. So AVO2 difference is going to be lower um, caused by the decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen. Um, the cardiac output max difference is um, all the things we've already talked about here. If we look at the graph here, we have increasing levels of altitude. We have a percentage of um, VO2 max from uh, sea level being 100%. To zero being we're not using or we're not producing any energy aerobically. So as we increase the altitude, we see this decrease the VO2 max uh, capabilities of the body. And the first 4,000 meters or so, as we're decreasing, is going to be primarily because we're not fully saturating our hemoglobin. Once we get beyond 4,000 meters, that's, that's still a major factor, but now we're gonna get progressively more uh, impact from a decrease in cardiac output max. All right, so that was what happens uh, with a cardiovascular system uh, when we go up to altitude. But what happens with ventilation, pulmonary ventilation, so how much we're breathing in and out. So if we look at this uh, graph here, we have increasing levels of oxygen consumption, VO2. Um, so in other words, increasing levels of aerobic exercise intensity. So getting on a treadmill, going faster and faster and faster. Um, and then we have ventilation in liters per minute. So how much air is coming in and out of the lungs. So at sea level, we have an increase in ventilation with an increase in exercise intensity. We all know we breathe harder as we work out harder. Um, but this is much more dramatic when looking at what happens at an a level of altitude uh, far above sea level. So we're gonna have an increase in ventilation that's gonna be really exaggerated here. So if you're at altitude long enough, you're gonna acclimate to that altitude. Um, and so when you acclimate to the altitude, your exercise performance is going to be improved um, compared to what it was when you first went to altitude. So you're gonna get slowly closer to your sea level version of yourself. Um, and so this takes usually about three weeks to get used to moderate levels of altitude. So talking going to Denver, Colorado, up to maybe Mexico City or something like that. And for every 600 meter increase in the altitude after you've gotten to this sort of moderate level of altitude, you need another week to acclimate. So three weeks to get used to moderate level, go up 600 meters, it's going to take four weeks, go up another 600, now five weeks, and so on and so forth. Once you come back down to sea level, you're able to maintain these improvements um, that you're going to see. So again, this is why people go to altitude to live or to train and then come back to sea level to compete because you're able to maintain these effects for about a month after coming to sea level. So the effects, uh, the primary one is going to be, uh, if you're there long enough, an increase in red blood cells, which means more hemoglobin going around your blood to uh, take up oxygen and carry it to the tissues that need that oxygen. So like I just mentioned, 
uh, increase in red blood cells is going to occur because we're releasing EP EPO from the kidneys, causing the bone marrow to create and release red blood cells. And we're going to have uh, greater oxygen saturation happening in the lungs. Um, simply the, the blood vessels of the lungs get used to uh, dilating a little more, allowing a little more blood to go in them. And it's probably um, more optimal to live at high altitude but come back down to sea level every day to do your exercise and then go back up to altitude in order to you know, spend the rest of your day than it is to go to altitude and train at altitude and be there all the time. The reason why is all these negative effects on your aerobic performance that we've been talking about, they're gonna happen when you're training as well. So if you're gonna be at a disadvantage when you're training, that means your uh, training intensity is gonna decrease as well. So if your training intensity is decreasing and you're going to be doing this for several weeks to months, you're going to actually have a little bit of a detraining effect. So your other bodily systems that are related to aerobic fitness are actually going to detrain a little bit. Your muscles are going to detrain and things like that because they're not getting the workout that they normally would have gotten at sea level because your exercise intensity has come down a little bit. So the optimal effects of altitude are seen when you live at altitude train at sea level and then go back to altitude for the rest of your day and just do that for an extended period of time. So some of the other things that are going to happen when you um, acclimate to altitude is you're going to have a decrease in the cross-sectional area of your muscle. In other words, your muscles are going to shrink and atrophy. Um, so for strength-based or power-based um, athletes, this is not such a good thing. But we're also going to have an increase in the capillary density in the muscle. So the capillaries are those small vessels of the, the vascular network that are allowing all of the transfer of oxygen, of CO2, of waste products, of uh, glucose to take place. So the capillaries is where all that transfer is taking place. So if you have more, uh, more densely packed capillaries within the muscle, that means those muscle fibers are going to be able to get fuel and to get oxygen more easily because they just have a better blood supply. We do have some of that protein wasting, but we also have a much greater um, blood delivery system after acclimation to altitude. So I hope that helped. This was a very quick overview of exercise physiology uh, going to a high altitude, so going well above sea level. Um, it does have a, a decrease in your, per, your performance aerobically, anaerobically not so much. Over time we do adapt and we uh, get better at dealing with that altitude and it can even have some positive benefits for um, your ability to compete at sea level. So if you have any comments, please leave them below. Questions, you can leave those below as well and come back to watch another one of these videos. I'll be uploading more shortly. Thanks.